Welcome to Comsoul Entertainment. We have received numerous requests by our fans on the need to have in-depth research on COVID-19 and expert assessments on its vaccine development so as to educate ourselves on its safety before making informed decisions on whether to be vaccinated or not. We hope that this video, coupled with the advice of your personal physician helps you in making that informed decision. Before we go ahead, please click the subscribe button and the bell icon below so as to be timely notified as soon as we upload new videos. And equally important, please comment below. Let us know how you feel about the video and suggestions on where we need to improve. Thank you for being here. Coronavirus disease, COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. Most people infected with the COVID-19 virus will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment. Older people and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer are more likely to develop serious illnesses. The best way to prevent and slow down transmission is to be well informed about the COVID-19 virus, the disease it causes, and how it spreads. Protect yourself and others from infection by washing your hands or using an alcohol-based rub frequently and not touching your face. The COVID-19 virus spreads primarily through droplets of saliva, or discharge from the nose when an infected person coughs or sneezes, so it's important that you also practice respiratory etiquette. For example, by coughing into a flexed elbow. Protect yourself and others from COVID-19. If COVID-19 is spreading in your community, stay safe by taking some simple precautions, such as physical distancing, wearing a mask, keeping rooms well ventilated, avoiding crowds, cleaning your hands, and coughing into a bent elbow or tissue. Check local advice where you live and work. Do it all. What to do to keep yourself and others safe from COVID-19. Maintain at least a one meter distance between yourself and others to reduce your risk of infection when they cough, sneeze, or speak. Maintain an even greater distance between yourself and others when indoors. The further away, the better. Make wearing a mask a normal part of being around other people. The appropriate use storage and cleaning or disposal are essential to make masks as effective as possible. Here are the basics of how to wear a mask. Clean your hands before you put your mask on, as well as before and after you take it off, and after you touch it at any time. Make sure it covers both your nose, mouth, and chin. When you take off a mask, store it in a clean plastic bag. And every day either wash it if it's a fabric mask. And for health workers please, dispose a medical mask in a trash bin. Don't use masks with valves. For specifics on what type of mask to wear and when, read our questions and answers, and watch our videos. Find out more about the science of how COVID-19 infects people, and how our bodies react, by watching more of our videos. For specific advice for decision makers, please see World Health Organization's Technical Guidance. How to make your environment safer. Avoid the three C's. Avoid spaces that are closed, crowded, or involve close contact. Outbreaks have been reported in restaurants, choir practices, fitness classes, nightclubs, offices and places of worship where people have gathered, often in crowded indoor settings where they talk loudly, shout, breathe heavily or sing. The risks of getting COVID-19 are higher in crowded and inadequately ventilated spaces where infected people spend long periods of time together in close proximity. These environments are where the virus appears to spreads by respiratory droplets or aerosols more efficiently. So taking precautions is even more important. Meet people outside. Outdoor gatherings are safer than indoor ones. Particularly, if indoor spaces are small and without outdoor air coming in. For more information on how to hold events like family gatherings, children's football games, and family occasions, please read the CDS's questions and answers on small public gatherings. Avoid crowded or indoor settings. But if you can't, then take precautions, open a window. Increase the amount of natural ventilation when indoors. Please wear a mask. Avoid making wearing a mask a political or religious question. It will help save your life and the lives of others who are in close proximity to you. It is a life or death kind of question. Period. Don't forget the basics of good hygiene. Regularly and thoroughly clean your hands with an alcohol-based hand rub. Or wash them with soap and water. This eliminates germs including viruses that may be on your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Hands touch many surfaces and can pick up viruses. Once contaminated, 
hands can transfer the virus to your eyes, nose, or mouth. From there, the virus can enter your body and infect you. Cover your mouth and nose with your bent elbow or tissue when you cough or sneeze. Then dispose of the used tissue immediately into a closed bin and wash your hands. By following good respiratory hygiene, you protect the people around you from viruses, which cause colds, flu, and COVID-19. Clean and disinfect surfaces frequently, especially those which are regularly touched, such as door handles, faucets, and phone screens. What to do if you feel unwell or ill? Know the full range of symptoms of COVID-19. The most common symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, dry cough, and tiredness. Other symptoms that are less common and may affect some patients include loss of taste or smell, aches and pains, headaches or throat, nasal congestion, red eyes, diarrhea, or a skin rash. Stay home and self-isolate even if you have minor symptoms such as cough, headache, mild fever, until you recover. Call your healthcare provider or hotline for advice. Have someone bring you supplies. If you need to leave your house or help someone near you, wear a medical mask to avoid infecting others. If you have a fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention immediately. Call by telephone first if you can, and follow the directions of your local health authority. Keep up to date on the latest information from trusted sources, such as the World Health Organization, or your local and national health authorities like the CDC for American citizens and those who live in the U.S. Local and national authorities and public health units are best placed to advise on what people in your area should be doing to protect themselves. COVID-19 Similarities and Differences with Influenza As the COVID-19 outbreak continues to evolve, comparisons have been drawn to influenza. Both cause respiratory disease, yet there are important differences between the two viruses and how they spread. This has important implications for public health measures that can be implemented to respond to each virus. How are COVID-19 and influenza viruses similar? Firstly, COVID-19 and influenza viruses have a similar disease presentation. That is, they both cause respiratory disease, which presents as a wide range of illnesses from asymptomatic or mild through to severe disease and death. Secondly, both viruses are transmitted by contact, droplets, and fomites. As a result, the same public health measures, such as hand hygiene and good respiratory etiquette, coughing into your elbow or into a tissue and immediately disposing of the tissue, are important actions we all can take to prevent infection. How are COVID-19 and influenza viruses different? The speed of transmission is an important point of difference between the two viruses. Influenza has a shorter median incubation period, the time from infection to appearance of symptoms, and a shorter serial interval the time between successive cases, than COVID-19 virus. The serial interval for COVID-19 virus is estimated to be 5 to 6 days. While for influenza virus, the serial interval is 3 days. This means that influenza can spread faster than COVID-19. Also, transmission in the first 3 to 5 days of illness, or potentially pre-symptomatic transmission. Transmission of the virus before the appearance of symptoms is a major driver of transmission for influenza. In contrast, while we are learning that there are people who can shed COVID-19 virus 24 to 48 hours prior to symptom onset. At present, this does not appear to be a major driver of transmission. The reproductive number, the number of secondary infections generated from one infected individual is understood to be between 2 and 2.5 for COVID-19 virus, higher than for influenza. However, estimates for both COVID-19 and influenza viruses are very context and time specific, making direct comparisons more difficult now. Children are important drivers of influenza virus transmission in the community. For COVID-19 virus, initial data indicates that children are less affected than adults and that clinical attack rates in the 0 to 19 age group are low. Further preliminary data from household transmission studies in around the world suggest that children are infected from adults, rather than vice versa. While the range of symptoms for the two viruses is similar, the fraction with severe disease appears to be different. For COVID-19, data to date suggests that 80% of infections are mild or asymptomatic, 15% are severe infection, requiring oxygen and 5% are critical infections, requiring ventilation. These fractions of severe and critical infection would be higher than what is observed for influenza infection. Those most at risk for severe influenza infection are children, pregnant women, elderly, 
those with underlying chronic medical conditions and those who are immunosuppressed. For COVID-19, our current understanding is that older age and underlying conditions increase the risk for severe infection. Mortality for COVID-19 appears higher than for influenza, especially seasonal influenza. While the true mortality of COVID-19 will take some time to fully understand, the data we have so far indicate that the crude mortality ratio, the number of reported deaths divided by the reported cases, is between 3 to 4 percent, the infection mortality rate, the number of reported deaths divided by the number of infections, will be lower. For seasonal influenza, mortality is usually well below 0.1 percent. However, mortality is to a large extent determined by access to and quality of health care. The COVID-19 pandemic has spread with alarming speed. Infecting millions and bringing economic activity to a near standstill as countries impose tight restrictions on movement to halt the spread of the virus. As the health and human toll grows, the economic damage is already evident and represents the largest economic shock the world has experienced in decades. The June 2020 Global Economic Prospects describes both the immediate and near-term outlook for the impact of the pandemic and the long-term damage it has dealt with prospects for growth. The baseline forecast envisions a 5.2% contraction in global GDP in 2020. Using market exchange rate weights, the deepest global recession in decades. Despite the extraordinary efforts of governments to counter the downturn with fiscal and monetary policy support. Over the longer horizon, the deep recessions triggered by the pandemic are expected to leave lasting scars through lower investment, an erosion of human capital through lost work and schooling, and fragmentation of global trade and supply linkages. The crisis highlights the need for urgent action to cushion the pandemic's health and economic consequences, protect vulnerable populations, and set the stage for a lasting recovery. For emerging market and developing countries, many of which face daunting vulnerabilities, it is critical to strengthen public health systems, address the challenges posed by informality, and implement reforms that will support strong and sustainable growth once the health crisis abates. The pandemic is expected to plunge most countries into recession in 2020, with per capita income contracting in the largest fraction of countries globally since 1870. Advanced economies are projected to shrink 7%. That weakness will spill over to the outlook for emerging markets and developing economies, who are forecast to contract by 2.5% as they cope with their own domestic outbreaks of the virus. This would represent the weakest showing, by this group of economies in at least 60 years. More than 90 vaccines are being developed against COVID-19 by research teams in companies and universities across the world. Researchers are trialing different technologies, some of which haven't been used in a licensed vaccine before. At least six groups have already begun injecting formulations into volunteers in safety trials, others have started testing in animals. All vaccines aim to expose the body to an antigen that won't cause disease but will provoke an immune response that can block or kill the virus if a person becomes infected. There are at least eight types being tried against the coronavirus, and they rely on different viruses or viral parts. At least seven teams are developing vaccines using the virus itself, in a weakened or inactivated form. Many existing vaccines are made in this way, such as those against measles and polio, but they require extensive safety testing. Around 25 groups say they are working on viral vector vaccines. A virus such as measles or adenovirus is genetically engineered so that it can produce coronavirus proteins in the body. These viruses are weakened so they cannot cause disease. There are two types, those that can still replicate within cells and those that cannot because key genes have been disabled. At least 20 teams are aiming to use genetic instructions, in the form of DNA or RNA, for a coronavirus protein that prompts an immune response. The nucleic acid is inserted into human cells, which then churn out copies of the virus protein. Most of these vaccines encode the virus's spike protein. Many researchers want to inject coronavirus proteins directly into the body. Fragments of proteins or protein shells that mimic the coronavirus's outer coat can also be used. More than 70% of the group's leading vaccine research efforts are from industrial or private firms. Clinical trials start with small safety studies in animals and people, followed by much larger trials to determine whether a vaccine generates an immune response. Researchers are accelerating these steps and hope to have a vaccine ready as fast as the speed of light, considering the alarming proportion of deaths associated with the virus all over the world. And now, a few months after, all these efforts, 
With numerous technologies and billions of dollars in pledge by countries around the world, there seems to be a glimmer of hope as the first coronavirus vaccine is given emergency approval by both the UK and US governments. Before the coronavirus crisis, the fastest a vaccine had ever been developed was back in the 1960s, to prevent mumps. That took four years. The race to come up with a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has been hailed as a historical milestone for undergoing development in under a single year. Never before has a vaccine been produced so quickly. Americans and people around the world largely appear to welcome these efforts. Polling suggests that most adults will get a coronavirus vaccine when one becomes available to them. But it's worth asking exactly how scientists were able to produce multiple vaccines in such a short time span. We spoke to three experts about the speed at which vaccines against the coronavirus have been developed. Dr. Florian Kramer, a microbiology professor at Mount Sinai's Icon School of Medicine in New York City. Dr. Gigi Granval, a senior scholar and associate professor at Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Thad Stappenbeck, a leading physician at the Cleveland Clinic. All of them said they understood why people may have questions about the process but agreed that the first doses rolling out are safe and effective and all of them indicated they would get the shots themselves, particularly as the risk of contracting COVID-19 compounds over time. Here's how scientists broke records to arrive at a vaccine. Funding is usually a big hurdle that slows down vaccine development. Not so during the coronavirus pandemic. Billions of vaccine doses are going to be required to keep the virus in check over the next several years after it crippled the global economy and prompted unemployment to rise to levels not seen since the Great Depression. That enormous market and unprecedented demand prompted ample pledges for funding for its development. Typically, when you produce or develop a vaccine, at each step along the road, you ask yourself, do we have the money to move forward? Is it worth moving forward? Said Dr. Kramer. The United States government alone has pledged more than $10 billion to companies working on coronavirus vaccines as part of Operation Warp Speed. The Trump administration's effort to support vaccine developers. Drug makers are also more willing to take financial risks given the urgency of the crisis. These companies were able to let the science proceed, Dr. Granval said. The trial phases in manufacturing overlapped somewhat to save time without compromising safety. The process for developing vaccines is standardized. Normally, an exploratory and design period can take several years before eventually leading to clinical trials, which are held in three phases, followed by regulatory review and large-scale manufacturing. Researchers aim to establish an appropriate dosage level in phase 1 trials, moving on to a larger group of human study subjects in phase 2 to show, hopefully, that the drug offers some health benefit. Last spring's phase I trials initially saw a whopping immunologic response, Dr. Stappenbeck said. So the FDA let them essentially move right into phase 2, which was also successful. Phase 3 is the big one. Where a large number of people are recruited to try out the drug or a placebo and evaluate the side effects. Phase 3 ends when enough people have contracted the virus in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group, giving you the vaccine's efficacy. With many other diseases, Dr. Kramer explained, it takes a while to build up enough cases in the pool of study participants. Now we are in this absurd situation that, because there is so much virus, we get results quicker, he said. If you would have controlled the virus circulation very well, and there would have been no wave in the fall, we would not have any efficacy results. We would still be waiting. Usually, companies developing vaccines aim to mitigate financial risk by waiting until each phase is complete before moving on to the next one. Companies developing coronavirus vaccines however have been able to move more quickly because the financial risk is lower. They literally did everything that they would have done over a period of years in 10 months. Think of it like an accordion that's pushed in. So everything is there, it's just in a smaller package, said Dr. Stappenbeck. In the case of Pfizer, British Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency sped things along further by looking at thousands of pages of safety and efficacy documentation on a rolling basis, whereas the American Food and Drug Administration waited for more complete data. Officials were eating turkey sandwiches on Thanksgiving while reviewing documents. The FDA's Peter Marks, who leads the group that decides which coronavirus vaccines are safe enough for widespread use, said in an interview with the Journal of the American Medical Association. Drug makers have also tried to be transparent in their research by making a lot of their documentation freely available online, Kramer said, so people can look at it for themselves. A number of problems can crop up at any point along the entire process. 
Sometimes researchers run into unexpected side effects in humans, or safety and efficacy problems, or trouble with regulatory agencies. A vaccine being developed by the Australia's University of Queensland became the first to be abandoned earlier this month after researchers discovered that it produced false positive HIV test results. In normal times, a drug maker would certainly not get started on large-scale manufacturing during the clinical trial phases, because relatively few drugs actually get approved each year. You wouldn't put up that kind of money, Gronval said. But that's what companies have been doing. Moderna, whose vaccine is close to cinching emergency approval for use in the U.S., started scaling up its manufacturing abilities in late March and struck a deal to provide the U.S. 100 million doses in August. Pfizer, whose vaccine was the first to secure emergency approval in both the U.K. and the U.S., settled on which facilities it would use to make its drug back in May. By the end of July, the company had agreed to supply the U.S. with an initial order of 100 million doses, even though final clinical trial results were several months away. Scientists weren't starting from scratch. They had research to build on from past viral outbreaks. The last two decades have seen two other outbreaks of different coronaviruses. Technically, the term coronavirus refers to a whole family of viruses, but it is often used as shorthand for the specific virus that causes COVID-19 due to its sheer prevalence. SARS-CoV, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, and MERS-CoV, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, emerged in 2002 and 2012, respectively. Scientists began the process of developing a vaccine for SARS-CoV, and two drugs underwent phase I trials, Kramer describes in a paper published in the journal Nature. Development stopped. Though, because the virus had petered out by 2004 and it was no longer worth the cost. A vaccine for MERS-CoV is still being developed, eight years after it first appeared. Neither virus, of course, came anywhere near the scale of the current crisis, in the US, just eight people caught SARS, and two people caught MERS. Because the virus currently spreading rapidly around the world, SARS-CoV-2 is related to SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. Researchers had a head start on how to potentially design the vaccine. They already knew which protein to focus on. Plus, they had a body of research on mRNA vaccines. In another scientific milestone, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines successfully make use of mRNA, or messenger RNA, which has never before been used in a vaccine approved in the US that doesn't mean it's a brand new technology. mRNA vaccines have been studied for more than a decade, with the first human trials beginning in 2013. So while we may only have data going back two months on the people who took, for example, the Pfizer vaccine, scientists have been tracking people who have taken experimental mRNA drugs for much longer. There is certainly data in, you know, not in tens of thousands of people, but in hundreds of people where you have long-term data, Kramer said. Whereas many vaccines protect us by putting an inactivated virus in our bodies, triggering an immune response that produces antibodies, a messenger RNA vaccine works differently. It contains instructions that teach our cells how to make a small piece of the virus, in this case, the spike protein you need to SARS-CoV-2, which also triggers an immune response. Our bodies then know how to recognize that spike protein and fight off the virus if we are exposed to it for real. The mRNA does not interact with our human DNA whatsoever. RNA itself is very delicate, which is why some of the vaccines need to be kept at extremely low temperatures in special freezers. The instructions are encased in a lipid, or fat, for transport. They had developed a really clever technology where they were able to take these really unstable mRNA molecules, stabilize them enough, and then encapsulate them, Stappenbeck said. A lot of the work that would have taken years and years and years to develop, to do in animal models, had essentially already been done. Once the instructions have been delivered, the elements of the vaccine get broken down right away. The design of it is really simple. It's just an mRNA in the lipid. There's really no other chemicals, no other factors that are present in it that could produce side effects in some small group of the population, Stappenbeck said. The vaccine effort is global. Chinese scientists sequenced the virus's genome back in January, sharing the information with the world soon after. Independent regulatory agencies in the US, Canada, Britain, and elsewhere have been largely open and collaborative with one another to move the process along more efficiently than ever before. Although we have seen the Trump administration try and exert undue influence over the CDC, none of the experts we spoke to had any concern that the administration would affect the FDA's science-bound decision-making process. Kramer stressed that the FDA is widely respected, saying, there's a lot of good scientists there. In the end, they are data-driven. They're not driven by politics, and they know what they have to lose. 
The other thing is that scientists and physicians around the world have read the same reports, Stappenbeck said. What you don't see is physicians from the Cleveland Clinic getting on Twitter, or blogs, or interviews, and saying that they're wrong. If people are really concerned about this, all they have to do is, you know, Google COVID-19 Moderna and then whatever major medical center they want to put in, and they can read about what the experts at that medical center are saying, he added. And what they'll see is a uniform chorus, really across the country, where everyone is in agreement that this is the right thing to do. As with any medical intervention, there will always be some risk to take into account. But you don't need to be an expert to evaluate it, Kramer said. Just thinking about risk analysis, what do I risk if I do take the vaccine versus what do I risk if I don't take the vaccine? If I do take the vaccine, I know that 40,000 people were fine, he said, referring to the total number of people who received a vaccine in Pfizer and Moderna's clinical trials. On the other side, you have the risk of getting infected. Negative side effects generally happen relatively soon after vaccination. In 2009 for example, an increased risk of narcolepsy was discovered shortly after people in Europe began taking an H1N1 vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline. That drug was never authorized for use in the US. Experts told said that it is possible some previously unrecorded low-frequency side effects will become apparent in the next several months as more and more people get the new vaccines. That is largely because data is lacking for some groups, such as pregnant women, who are generally advised to hold off on getting the vaccine. People with severe allergies too, are being told to wait. It's not likely that side effects will crop up unexpectedly years down the line. Medical centers that dole out the vaccine in the US are also working to monitor people who have received the drugs for any adverse effects. The CDC is using a smartphone app called VSafe, which allows people to complete health check-ins, to help them do so, too. People who get a coronavirus vaccine are likely to experience some of the more common side effects in the following day or so. We should anticipate potentially feeling fatigued or experiencing headache chills or muscle pain shortly after getting the jab. But know that is to be expected. How long it takes for the coronavirus vaccine to work? Are the COVID-19 shots effective right after you get them? Here's the timeline you can expect and other important information to know. After a wild and unpredictable year, a coronavirus vaccine is finally here. The first batches are expected to be delivered before the end of 2020 and will prioritize healthcare workers on the front lines. Gradually, as more doses become available, the rest of the population will get vaccinated throughout 2021. Even when you get the vaccine, it'll take some time for your body to build an immune response that'll keep you safe and protected. Because of that delay and other unknowns related to the vaccine, Doctors are asking people not to let their guard down even after getting vaccinated. In other words, it'll take time for the vaccine to kick in, and we should still plan to play it safe after getting the immunizations. What happens in your body when you get the coronavirus vaccine? The vaccines designed to prevent COVID-19 are using a type of vaccine technology called messenger RNA, mRNA. Each jab in the arm is essentially includes instructions that teach your body how to fight and destabilize the coronavirus if it comes into contact with it. Recently, the CDC chief Dr. Anthony S. Fauci. Of course you know him. The one that gives President Trump a daily headache and made him tweet even at 2 in the early morning frequently. Yes, that one. Being interviewed on TV recently, here is what he got to say on the two vaccines approved so far even as the number of infections and deaths are skyrocketing daily with more than 300,000 already lost in the US alone, and more than 17,000 in little over a week. He said, well you know, it was bittersweet because we are still in the terrible situation with the numbers that you mentioned, the deaths, the hospitalizations, the number of cases, and yes we're really now starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. That is going to ultimately get us through this. We know we're going to be able to put this behind us. But in the meantime, we still have a struggle ahead of us. So, we've got to get people vaccinated as quickly and as expeditiously as we possibly can. Until we get that herd immunity as we say, which will require in my opinion about 75-80% to 80 of the population getting vaccinated. But in the meantime, we have to adhere to public health measures in order to blunt the acceleration of these terrible numbers that we hear every day. On the skepticism people have on how we can be sure the vaccine is safe as it was being developed in jet speed quick. This is a great question, he said. The speed was not at all at the sacrifice of safety. The speed was the reflection of extraordinary advances in the science of vaccine platform technology to be able to do things technically in months, that some time ago, 5 to 10 years ago may have taken several years. In addition, the extraordinary investment. When I say investment, 
I'm talking hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in getting the vaccine ready to be distributed as soon as it was proven to be safe and effective. So people understandably are skeptical about the speed. But we have to keep emphasizing that speed means, the science was extraordinary that got us here. Also, it is worthy to mention that a lot of dignitaries have volunteered to be vaccinated in public and on camera in order to boost the acceptance of the vaccine by the general public. Some of them are former presidents Barack Obama, Clinton, George W. Bush, and many others. Even President-elect Joe Biden has also volunteered to be vaccinated publicly. With this information there I am personally convinced that the vaccine is safe for me. Disclaimer. Please note that the purpose of this video is solely for education on the information available publicly so far and not a recommendation for you to take the vaccine. Consult your personal physician before making any medical decision. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the notification icon in order to be notified as soon as we upload new videos.